Hey y'all, today we're going to be finishing up our discussion on limits. Now last time in last video, we discussed a graphical approach and the main intuition behind limits. This time, we're going to be discussing the algebraic side of limits. If you're given a function without the graph, how do you compute the limit? So, let's get in. Now in this class, we're only going to be concerned with two types of functions as far as our initial study of limits goes. And these are going to be polynomials and rational functions. So, let's start our conversation with polynomials, the simplest of all functions. If we have a polynomial, and remember, a polynomial is just powers of x combined with coefficients attached to them. And then we have a bunch of additions and or subtractions in between. So, think of the function like x squared minus 4. That's a polynomial function. If we have a polynomial function, let's call it p, then when you do the limit as x approaches some number, let's call it c, of our polynomial, all you have to do to compute this thing is just plug in the number c. So that's going to be our first rule. If given a polynomial and you're trying to find the limit, just plug in the number at the bottom that we're trying to evaluate. For instance, let's calculate the limit as x approaches 3 of the function x squared minus 5. Well, revert back to our rule right here, just plug in the number, and we'll see that the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 5x is just 3 squared minus 5 times 3. Doing some simplification, this is just 9 minus 15 which will give us an answer of negative 6. So just plug in the dang number if you have a polynomial. Now what you'll also see is that with rational functions, we're going to follow the same thing. Now recall that a rational function is just a polynomial divided by, yet again, another polynomial. So it kind of makes sense that these guys would follow the same rules. So now, if you are computing the limit as x approaches some number c of your rational function, all you do is just plug in the dang number. So the limit as x approaches c of r of x is just r evaluated at c. Now since r of x was equal to a polynomial divided by a polynomial, that just means plug in c to both top and bottom. There's only one stipulation that could come out of this. We could have that the bottom equals zero, in which case things would go wrong, we'd be dividing by zero. So, this is pendant that the bottom does not equal zero. But yet again, the rule is simple. Just plug in the dang number. For example, with our rational functions, let's look at the limit as x approaches negative 2 of our function x plus 3 divided by x squared. Since it is a rational function, these are both polynomials, all we do is plug in negative 2 to the equation. So in this case, negative 2 plus 3 over negative 2, remember the parentheses squared, should be our limit. Now, go ahead and simplify out. The top will become a positive 1, while the bottom, negative 2 squared, will become a positive 4. So our answer will end up being 1 fourth. So, these are our first rules. Given that we're only looking at these two functions, just plug in the dang number. And now that we've covered our general rule, let's talk about when things go wrong with limits. Now, in order to do this, let's use our rational function from a little bit ago, the function x plus 3 divided by x squared. And now I want you to evaluate the limit of this thing as x approaches 0. So, remembering our rule, all we do is plug the dang number in. This will lead us with 0 plus 3 divided by 0 squared, or 3 divided by 0. Now, this is going to be an issue for us. Because we're dividing by 0, many of you are aware that we just can't really do that. But let's talk about a little bit of a reason why. Let's say, hypothetically, that this thing right here equaled some number, I'll call it A for answer. Well, if 3 divided by 0 equaled a for answer, what I could do is multiply 0 up top, which would then give me 3 
equals zero times a. Now it's your job to tell me which number a happens so when I multiply it by zero, what number a gives me three when I do that. And you might be thinking, well, any number times zero should, ne should be zero, and it should never equal three. And you'd be exactly right. So since this will never happen, there's no number where we can have this, what we're going to go ahead and say is that the answer, the limit, does not exist. Now, what we're going to find is that when you have a non-zero number divided by zero, that's going to correlate with a vertical asymptote on the graph. So, this is our first general rule. Rule. We're going to say in blue-collar English. Non-zero divided by zero means that your answer is does not exist. Let's try another type of problem where things go wrong for us right away. And this is going to be got brought on by yet again another rational function. Hint, polynomials, things go right for. Rational could be. So, in this case, the rational function is x squared minus 25 divided by x minus 5. And we're trying to calculate the limit as x approaches 5. So yet again, lean on the first rule we discovered. Just plug the dang number in. So, in this case, we experiment by plugging it in. Well, it looks like we're going to get 5 squared minus 25, all divided by 5 minus 5. Doing out some algebra, this thing will become 0 divided by 0. Now, you might have um, heard in the last slide, in the last uh, video, that we talked about it had to be non-zero divided by 0 in order for the limit to not exist. So what happens when we have 0 divided by 0? Well, let's do our experiment. Let's say that this thing right here equaled some answer, some number a. Yet again, using our little trick, multiplying up, we would get the equation 0 equals 0 times a. And now I ask you, what number a has a property that when multiplied by 0 gives you 0? What number a can you plug right in here? Well, the answer is anything. If you plug in 7 right here, 7 times 0 equals 0. If you plug in negative 2, negative 2 times 0 equals 0. Even if you plug in pi to the 10,000th power, if you multiply it by 0, you get 0. So in this case right here, what we're going to go ahead and say is since we can't determine the exact answer, this will be called an indeterminate form. So an indeterminate form is just, I guess, a comp compilation of numbers such that we don't really know what the answer is. Now the good, the good news is that we can actually do a little bit more with this, which we'll get to in the next video. As of right now, our indeterminate forms that we're going to be running into are potentially two, zero over zero, and infinity divided by infinity. You can think about this case being indeterminate if you imagine infinity equals infinity times a number. Well, anything multiplied by infinity should still be infinity. So, we'll get to an example of how we work with this right now. Now, this is where we ended up with our last example. The limit as x approached 5 of our function x squared minus 25 divided by x minus 5 gave us an indeterminate form of 0 over 0. Now, what do we do from here? Well, it turns out if you reach an indeterminate form, like 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, that just tells you you have a little bit more algebra to do. So, we're actually going to ignore this work. Not that it was wrong, it gave us a little bit of information as far as how to proceed. Now, with 0 over 0, one thing that helps us and one thing that we're going to try to do is maybe do some algebra. 0 over 0 tells us perhaps there's a factor that's going to cancel for us. So we have to look hard at this um, rational function. If you notice, 
the top portion, the top polynomial, can actually be factored. x squared minus 25 factors into x minus 5 times x plus 5, all divided by that x minus 5 we had on bottom. Now, everything in your gut should be screaming, cancel, cancel. And actually, that's exactly what we can do. We can cancel these out. Now, what are we left over with? It looks like we're just going to have on top x plus 5 and on bottom just a placeholder of 1, so really just x plus 5. Now, I could have asked you this and just said, hey, it's a polynomial, do the limit, and you'd actually know how to proceed from here. So all we do from here is just plug in the dang number. So revert back to rule number one. This guy is just the dang number plugged in, 5 plus 5, giving us a, total, a final answer of 10. So the important thing to note right here, indeterminate, if you ever run into an indeterminate form, it just means one thing and one thing only. More algebra required. So don't stop in an indeterminate form, do some algebra out, cancel some things, and land on your final answer by going back to a rule of just plugging things in once you get stuff canceled out. Now we've handled infinity being found on the outside once we evaluate the limit. Let's talk about now, what if I ask you something like this? How do we handle the limit as x approaches infinity, or negative infinity for that matter, of a rational function? So, yet again, this is a rational function, so it's a polynomial divided by a polynomial, in which case n stands for the uh, numerator and d stands for the denominator. Well, if we plugged in infinity, assuming that neither of them is just a constant, like just a number, we'd probably get, more often than not, infinity divided by infinity. Now that was an indeterminate form, which would tell me that I need to do a little bit more algebra. However, we can actually shortcut this process by learning just a simple thing. And that's going to be to look at the degree of the numerator and denominator. All right, now as promised, here's a list of shortcuts that we can use when dealing with limits as x approaches infinity, which by the way will lead us to horizontal asymptotes. So this is a cool way of figuring out horizontal asymptotes. Now actually we're going to be using the same trick as far as figuring out horizontal asymptotes goes, so if you have that in your back pocket, good on you. Let's begin. The first case that could happen, the first thing I should mention, the degree of a polynomial is just the highest power that you have once multiplied out fully. And it's going to be important that you have it fully multiplied out, fully expanded. So, case number one. Let's say the degree of the top, n of x, is going to be bigger than the degree of the bottom, d of x. Well, in this case, if the top is bigger than the bottom, the limit will be infinity, or better said, does not exist. Now an example of this is over here. So the limit as x approaches infinity of our function x cubed minus 2x divided by 100x squared. In this case, we check the degree of the top and the bottom. Well, the degree of the top is 3, the degree of the bottom is 2, which would tell me then that this limit does not exist. Next scenario, what if we flip rolls? What if the degree of the top, the numerator, is less than the degree of the bottom? Well, in this case, what we say is the limit as x approaches infinity, if the top is smaller than the bottom, the bottom's bigger, this thing is actually just going to be the number 0. So an example of this, let's say the limit as x approaches infinity of the function x plus 7 divided by x times x minus 1. Now this is where the multiply it out fully comes into play. Don't be tempted. The degree of the bottom is actually going to be 2. And how we can see that is this. x plus 7 stays the same, but if I multiply in on the bottom, I'll get 
x squared minus x. So now the degree of the bottom is 2, the degree of the top is 1. That tells me the bottom's bigger, which means this thing will end up equaling 0. Last case, and maybe the trickiest, would be what if the degrees are equal? What if the top and bottom are actually perfectly matched? Well, in this case right here, the limit as x approaches infinity of the top and bottom would just be a ratio of coefficients. Technically a ratio of coefficients of the highest power. In this last case, if the degree of the top equals the degree of the bottom, what we're going to do is look for the highest power on both top and bottom and take a ratio of the numbers that are attached to them. For example, what if I tell you to find the limit as x approaches to infinity of the function 30x minus x squared divided by 2x squared minus 7? Well, we check the degrees. The degree on top is 2, the degree on bottom is 2. So in this case, we take a ratio of the coefficients of the leading powers. So, we go to the biggest power on top, right here, and notice the number that's attached with the x squared. Turns out it's a negative 1. So put a negative 1 on top. Do the same on the bottom. Go to the highest power, it's yet again an x squared, and take the number that's attached to the x squared, a 2. Put that on bottom. This ratio of the coefficient of the leading power ends up being our answer. So in this case, we'll get an answer of negative 1 half. Now, these rules are really handy. And yet again, you can get to these answers by just simplifying out the numerator and denominator. But it is a little bit of a convoluted process. So having these down is really going to save you some time. Hey, thanks for tuning in today, uh, where we covered the algebraic side of limits and how to handle them. So just some important tips to leave you on, some important notes. First off, remember our original rule. To evaluate a limit, particularly of a polynomial or a rational function, just plug the dang number into the equation, into the function. Some little caveats to that. If you get a non-zero number divided by zero, this is going to indicate that the limit does not exist. This leads to a vertical asymptote. On the flip side, if you get an indeterminate form, such as 0 divided by 0, or infinity divided by infinity, this tells you that you have some more algebra to do. Do some algebra, factor some things out, and get to a point where you can cancel something. Once you cancel, to cancel it, revert back to rule number 1. Just plug the dang number in again. Last but not least, we touched on how to evaluate limits as x approaches infinity. In order to do that, you could do some simplification out. However, it's a lot shorter to just look at the degree of the top and the bottom, see which one's bigger, and then use the appropriate rule. Go ahead and try the homework. Remember to write limit out every single time until you actually evaluate the limit, i.e. plug in the number, and good luck.